Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert. You're at the Listening Post. This week, irresistible online force meets immovable government object. Battle over Google censorship in China. Google pulls out of China. The media and Iran. I think the role of the new media was really important. A journalist who covered the story went to prison and made it out. Dateline Moscow. Sex, drugs, and videotape, the YouTube version. And the celestial sounds of a virtual choir. It was one of those relationships that seemed doomed from the start. And when it ended, the question wasn't why, but rather, how did it last that long? We're talking about Google and the company's decision to pull out of mainland China for what it called censorship and security reasons. Google's corporate motto is don't be evil, so it took a critical pounding back in 2006 when, in exchange for access to the Chinese market, it agreed to play by Beijing's rules on news and information. Our starting point this week is Chinese cyberspace, Google, and a story about censorship, commerce, and the security of corporate secrets, and what this conflict means for the flow of information in and from the world's most populous country. China is the biggest internet market on the planet today. It's getting bigger and it's growing fast. Google came into the Chinese market in 2006 and they've been under increasing pressure to censor their results. The only way you can really look at what the Chinese government is doing is that it fears the free flow of information. It's not just a question of censorship now, it's a question of Google's proprietary trade secrets. And what happens next in China online is going to be fascinating to watch. Google has been a news story in China ever since it launched Google.cn for the Chinese market in 2006. Google agreed to censor itself, to put political boundaries on what its Chinese users would find through the search engine. There is a moral argument about whether or not Google was right, and there's also a business argument. I would say from a business perspective, Google was right to go into China. It was the fastest growing internet economy massive amounts of people online. Whoever took China's search market would be on the license to print money, and that was Google's aim. The battle over Google censorship in China is escalating. The focus of most of the reporting on Google's decision was on the censorship issue and the recent cyber attack that Google says it came under, as did some of its Gmail users in China. Google says hackers access the email accounts of Chinese human rights activists. One of the major reasons that the company mentioned is the fact that it had detected hacks into its Gmail system within China of and against Chinese human rights activists and dissidents. So that is the reason that Google has had to reassess the situation. It is a different situation than back in 2006 when it was a censorship issue only. Now it has something to do with attacking the company and attacking the company's security. Google has stopped short of accusing the Chinese government of the cyber attack, but whoever did the hacking also breached the security of Google's own employees employees, targeting the company's valuable source code management systems. Those systems handle the myriad changes that developers make as they write software. That security breach is a big deal for Google. Stealing the source code is like stealing the keys to Google's information kingdom. There are critics who say that Google effectively exited China not out of a desire for human rights, but because its business was threatened by having its actual uh, source code and uh, you know, very, very sensitive um, technology hacked into by Chinese hackers. Now the question is, is, were they using that as a pretext to leave because their business was being threatened, or were they genuinely leaving because information and the media was being suppressed in China? And there are other commercial angles to this story that have to do with market share and revenue. Google is not the biggest search engine in China and never has been. It lags far behind Baidu, a Chinese company that went online in 2000, giving it a six-year jump on Google. If you look at most of the articles that have appeared in the Chinese press, the criticism has really been twofold. We've seen an argument which is that this is really a business decision that Google is dressing up as a matter of ethics. And people are saying, well, if Google had 90% of the search market in China rather than 30%, it wouldn't have made this decision to pull out. 
Actually, many people in China do believe what state media says about Google's withdrawal, which is that Google has withdrawn for financial reasons, that it's not done well in China, and less so because of any censorship reasons, and that the censorship reason is really a smart PR move by the company. The online search giant should not think it's an exception to China's cleanup campaign on the Internet. On the other hand, the people who have been using Google in China are the upper middle class intelligentsia, and what I mean by that are the educated class, Classes, the money classes, uh, the group of people that advertisers are interested in. And 30% of a market with an estimated 385 million people online, which is more than the entire population of the United States, is a lot of potential revenue. This latest chapter in the Google Goes to China story looks like one of those lose, lose, lose propositions. The companies lost a huge market. Most Chinese net surfers have one less place to go for news and information. And the government in Beijing is taking a huge public relations hit. Not only has Google left, but GoDaddy, the world's largest domain registrar, has also stopped registering domain names in China because of onerous uh, restrictions on, on user information. And it looks like what's really happening is the Chinese government, in, in favor of these short-term victories of maintaining control over the Internet, is making a long-term sacrifice in terms of the best information, best companies, and best access to technology in China. It's very difficult to assess just how much internet users in China will be affected by Google's departure. Anyone who wants to access blocked sites in China already know how. They would use proxies or VPNs, virtual private networks. So those people would not be affected. They'd simply jump the great firewall and access Google.com. I do think this is difficult for the Chinese government as well, and that's because they've been engaged on this big soft power push over the last year, few years to say we don't try and control everything. And all of a sudden they found themselves in the middle of a debate where everybody's saying, well hang on, this is the internet censorship that goes on, this is the scope of it and the scale of it, uh, and that's really not the kind of message that they want people to hear. The reporting of this story in the global media is beyond the reach of China's censors. Firewalls that China puts up on the web. But by logging out of the country, Google is sending a signal that information within China remains firmly under Beijing's control. Never mind the firestorm in the media. It shall pass. The Great Firewall remains intact. Here's how our Global Village voices see Google versus China. Information value is simply in being able to help the control society in order to preserve harmony and order. I do think this outcome was inevitable. The Chinese government doesn't back down from this confrontation, and of course I had no pressure to do so. Google, on the other hand, has had to deal with the pressure not just from public opinion and the voracious media, but also from the US government itself, which jumped on the bandwagon fairly early on. I think the real loser here is the Chinese consumers. While Google is currently still accessible from Hong Kong uncensored, I fear this will not be the case for long. If you've got an opinion on the media and would like to join our roster of Global Village Voices, the best way to get in touch is through Facebook or Twitter. Just go to those sites and look for the listening post page there. We will let you know what stories we're working on. Or you can reach us the old-fashioned way through our email address, listeningpost at aljazeera.net. Time now for Listening Post News Bites. Rupert Murdoch says come June, his Times of London will start charging for online access, and he wants other media owners to follow his lead. Murdoch owns News Corp, more than 170 papers worldwide. The Times will charge about $3 a week for web subscribers and half that for daily visitors to the Times' site. Murdoch's been on a crusade to get other newspapers that are currently free online to start charging for their content. He says free access is economically unsustainable for the industry. The New York Times says it will start charging in January of next year. Internet analysts are predicting that whatever money Rupert Murdoch makes on subscriptions, he will eventually lose because the Times of London's site will get fewer eyeballs and therefore online advertising revenues will plunge. There's a murky story out of Israel involving a female soldier turned journalist who's under house arrest in what appears to be a case related to Israel's policy of assassinating Palestinian militants. The journalist is a 23 year old, Anat Kam. She is reportedly accused of photocopying classified information during her time in the army, information regarding 
targeted killings that may have been illegal under Israel's own laws. For the first three months of her detention, Cam's story went untold in the Israeli mainstream media, which is still not reporting it because of a court-ordered ban on the story. But the case was widely discussed in the Israeli blogosphere and then covered outside the country. Now the Israeli newspaper Haaretz and a TV station there, Channel 10, are challenging the injunction in court. Reports say Cam goes to trial in mid-April and the prosecution will be seeking a 14-year sentence under Israel's espionage and treason laws. Until last year's military coup, the Central American country of Honduras was a relatively safe place to be a journalist, but that's all changed. We've already reported on the attack on Carol Cabrera, a right-wing radio broadcaster who was shot while giving an on-air interview from her car. She survived, although her companion TV host Joseph Achoa was killed. Now, two more radio journalists, Bayardo Mairena and a colleague of his, have been shot dead in the regional city of Juticalpa. They were killed upon leaving their station, Excelsior Radio, where they had just been on the air. Police say the attack on Cabrera appeared to be politically motivated, but they say they do not know what the motive behind the second shooting was. They're playing dirty in Russia when it comes to news organizations and political voices critical of the Kremlin. This YouTube video has attracted worldwide attention. It allegedly shows the editor of the Russian version of Newsweek magazine, Mikhail Fishman, apparently snorting cocaine in the company of an unidentified half-dressed woman. That followed the appearance of another video showing Fishman and a couple of political activists all apparently trying to bribe their way out of traffic tickets, which, as someone who's dealt with Russian policemen, I can tell you happens all the time. All of the videos were clearly set up to discredit government critics. One of the victims says he knows one of the women involved in the drug video, and he says she's an informant for the FSB, the intelligence agency that succeeded the KGB. We're back after the break with a first-hand account of what happens when the Iranian authorities disapprove of your reporting. Welcome back. We've reported extensively on the state of the media, old and new, in Iran. Maziar Bahari is an authority on that subject. He's an Iranian-Canadian who was based in Tehran for Newsweek magazine. Bahari is one of at least 110 journalists who were arrested by the authorities since last June's elections and the protests that followed. More than 50 of those journalists remain in custody. Bahari was held for 118 days of interrogation and, he says, torture. We caught up with him in London where he spoke at the Media Freedom Group Index on Censorship's annual award ceremony. Mazir Bahari now on the state of the media in Iran, the impact of new media there, his four months behind bars, and the fake news show that his captors were convinced was real. Mazir Bahari, thanks for speaking with us. Nice to be here. You said in a recent speech that being a journalist in Iran is one of the most insecure jobs in a country run by one of the most insecure governments in the world. The Islamic Republic has made journalists its prime target. How conscious were you before you were taken and, and imprisoned that you were one of those targets? Well, I always knew that the government did not exactly like what I was doing, but I didn't know that they would go that far and they would incarcerate me and torture me and interrogate me and accuse me of espionage. But the government of Iran has always had an uneasy relationship with the media. Even before the revolution, the relationship was not that easy. You've also said that one of the reasons that uh, maybe you got out of jail was because of the support that you received from journalists, from diplomats, the fact that you worked for an organization as prominent as Newsweek. Definitely, definitely. If I were an unknown blogger, working for an Iranian newspaper or a magazine or just writing my own blog, I wouldn't be here. I would be back in Evin prison. Because of the fact that I was working for Newsweek magazine, I received a lot of support from outside of Iran and people shamed and named the Iranian government. I am just uh, appalled at the treatment that uh, Mr. Bahari and others are receiving. And that led to my release as well. Hossein Derekshan is an Iranian blogger, an Iranian-Canadian blogger who's been in jail since November of 2008. What can you tell us about his case that does not put him in more danger than he's already experiencing? 
Well, the problem with Hussein Derakshan's case is that no one knows what is happening to him. Some people say that he's working with the government of Iran, he's working with the interrogators. Some people say that he's in a solitary confinement, that he's been in a solitary confinement for almost two years. But I think the international community, and especially Canadian government, because he's a Canadian citizen, has the responsibility to ask, to demand the Iranian government to tell the truth about the, about the case of Hussein Darachman and what is happening to him. Who is Jason Jones and why were you discussing <laughs> an American comedian with your interrogators? He's Canadian actually. Is he Canadian? Yeah, he's Canadian from Hamilton. Canadians are all over this story. Yeah, well, Jason Jones is a fake news reporter for The Daily Show, which is a fake uh, news show in the United States. Jason and his producer, they came to Iran and I happen to be one of the people they interviewed. Maziar Bahari and his message of radical reasonableness. And his gimmick was that he had a kafia scarf and he pretended to be a real redneck spy in Iran. When they arrested me, my captors accused me of espionage and they used different evidence against me including that sketch in The Daily Show. And, you know, uh, when they showed me that sketch and they told me that we have fresh evidence against you... Did that just... I was just dumbfounded. I thought that, I mean, that my God, just... I knew that you guys were idiots, but I didn't know that you were such morons. During the June protests, there was so much news that was delivered to the outside world through these social networking mechanisms, the Twitters the YouTubes, the Facebooks. And media, electronic media around the world, ran with that aspect of the story in a big way. People in Iran, though, have turned to Facebook, to Twitter, to texting, to get the word out about what's going on. And CNN has been monitoring these social media sites. I'm wondering whether it was as big a part of the story as it was reported at the time, or whether the impact of those new media mechanisms was slightly exaggerated because of the novelty aspect. No, no, I don't think that it was exaggerated. I think the uh, role of the new media was really important. You see, in the beginning of the revolution and for the first maybe two and a half decades of the revolution of the Islamic Republic, the religious traditional masses, they supported the government. The elite, they were critical of the government. But there was a big, big gap. That elite did not have any influence on the masses. But with these uh, new satellite channels and the internet, and especially in the past two, three years, with the new uh, social networking sites like Facebook and Twitter, that gap between the elite and the masses have shrunk. So, and because of that, the elite, they have a bigger influence on the masses and the vice versa and the masses, they can communicate with the elite as well. And that really scares the Iranian government. And that is the main story in Iran right now. Western news networks, Al Jazeera included, when all that material was coming out of Iran via Twitter, uh, social networking, Facebook, uploaded videos, those networks were quick to run with that for many reasons. And this picture on Twitter shows a man, his face bloodied from his injuries. But when you watched some of that coverage, what did you think of the journalism involved? You see, uh, citizen journalism is like modern art. It's full of crap. But there is good modern art and there is good citizen journalism. But most of it is crap. So it's up to the editors to edit those pieces and not to run away with whatever they have. When you sit in London, flip on the television and see Press TV, the Iranian state-run English language global news network, how does that sit with you given the way the Iranian authorities blocked news channels going into the country, be it the BBC, be it CNN? Well, I think that the fact that Press TV is uh, operating uh, with impunity in different Western capitals is just shameful. If the government of Iran blocks transmission, then the Iranian government should not be able to use those same satellites 
to transmit, and that is what's happening right now. And I hope that the organizations whose transmissions are jammed, like the BBC, show a little bit more spine and go after the Iranian government, because freedom of expression is a universal value. You're not allowed back in Iran, or you said you're not going to go back as long as this government is in place. Um, what are you doing for work these days? Still working as a journalist, but I have to be in touch with my sources via Skype and mobile phone. Are you able to get on the phone to sources in Iran without putting them into danger? Well, I asked them to call me because the government is basically going after all journalists. All my colleagues in Iran, they are saying that they cannot operate freely. They cannot say what they want to say. And they can always uh, are in danger of imprisonment and torture. They, they better be careful not to talk to uh, The Daily Show. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think Daily Show will send anyone to Iran very soon. <laughs> Mazir Bahari, thanks for talking to us. Thanks a lot. Nice to be here. Finally, Eric Whitaker is an American composer who specializes in choral music. He says he went online once last year, heard someone singing one of his pieces on YouTube, and was quite moved by it. Then he thought, why not get 100 different voices together from all over the world to see if a virtual choir can make music online. The result, our web video of the week, is getting hundreds of thousands of hits. Check it out, and we'll see you next time at The Listening Post.